two cars, direct competitors in the same size category, Segment C, about the same size as a VW Golf. They were both on sale at around about the same time. This was 2010 to 2018, and this was 2012 to 2020. And both these models are Euro 5 emissions compliant. They both have small turbocharged engines with plenty of low down torque. This has a 1.6 with 270 newton meters, and this has a 1.4 with 250. But this car on the official NEDC combined cycle claims 72.4 imperial miles per gallon but that one only 53.3 and that's because this is powered by diesel and that takes petrol the question is though in real world driving in town on country roads and at 70 miles an hour how do they compare on fuel well let's find out I'm starting in the 2011 Citroen C4 with a 1.6 turbo diesel, and I have three routes planned, one in the city, one at motorway speeds, and one on country roads. And I'm gonna drive both cars on the exact same roads during times of the day where traffic should be similar to compare fuel economy. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to start from coal. This engine's already been run today, 34 miles actually. So I'm gonna make sure both engines are fully up to temperature before starting the test to make it fair. This one already is, so I'm gonna reset the trip computer. Where is it? There we go, reset. And I'm starting with the city driving, the city route. Let's see how it does. I'm not gonna try and drive the cars especially economical, neither am I gonna try and burn loads of fuel. I'm just gonna drive at my normal pace with traffic flow within the speed limit. I can't actually remember how long this city route is, but I'll put it on screen for you. I'll find out soon enough anyway, because it will mention it on the trip computer when I'm finished. And when it comes to the trip computer, I'm not just going by that for fuel economy, because this car is actually my other halves. So I know from the fuel tank method, from empty to full, roughly how much that trip computer lies. And usually this one overreads by 7%, so quite a bit. So I will be mentioning that adjustment when I tell you what fuel economy it's got at the end of each run. This car is an automatic or a robotized manual, and I'm just gonna leave it in auto mode, let it do its own thing, and with the stop start system switched on, which it's kicked in now. It's actually a very good system because it's a micro hybrid. It has a reversible alternator, therefore it can turn the engine on in just 0.4 seconds, and it does it smoothly as well. So it's a system that actually works. It kicks in often too, below about five miles an hour, it just switches off and the moment I want to get going again, it's there, power is ready, it's smooth and I can pull out at the junction with confidence. Just over two miles into the trip now and that's 57.6 imperial miles per gallon according to the trip computer. So it's probably going to be about 53, 54. It's usually three or four miles per gallon over what I actually get from this. My other half has had this car for a year and a half now, and she's about to get rid of it. In fact, it's for sale at the moment, and if it's still for sale when this video goes up, I'll put a link to the advert in the description. It's because she's bought a new car. She's actually quite enjoyed her time with this car, but she has been disappointed in one particular area. And that was, she got a diesel just as fuel prices went up, and then diesel prices stayed high whilst petrol prices went down. So throughout quite a lot of times she's owned this car, it's not actually been that much cheaper to have the diesel over a petrol, but you know, that's, uh, can't predict these things. Um, it's my fault because I actually chose this car for her. I think it suits her needs. She likes economy. She doesn't want to spend much on fuel. She wants space and she wants easy to drive and she wanted cheap and this car kind of fulfilled all those things but now she's getting a better car a Toyota Corolla hybrid which is actually rather good I'll be reviewing that later I accidentally just went the wrong way slightly it doesn't make a big difference to the journey it's a habit I usually go this way but I wanted to include a little bit of 20 doesn't matter though I'll do the same when I drive the other car 
So the routes will still be the same. I've just missed out a section of 20 mile per hour, which is about two minutes long. Strangely enough, both this and my petrol car feel similar to drive when you're in gear. They both produce a similar amount of torque. So if I'm in top gear at 50 miles an hour and want to accelerate to 70, they both feel about the same. Although the 0 to 60 time on this car is 11.1 seconds, yet the 0 to 60 time on my Leon is 8.1. So if I'm to go into a lower gear and really thrash the Leon, it really is a lot quicker than this car. But for normal driving, in gear, it's about the same. Just goes to show how little a 0 to 60 time can explain about a car. It doesn't tell you the full story at all when it comes to performance at least. This car is quite easy to drive around town. The fact it's an automatic or a robotized manual, if you're driving calmly like I am now, it actually works quite well. It doesn't work so well if you want to drive quickly though. Sometimes it will change gear when you don't want it to and therefore there's no power available but you can go to manual mode. That's what I tend to do if I want to drive more quickly and change gear via the paddles. So that way it's similar to driving a manual, but you don't do the clutch. It does it for you. So seven miles in, 62.7 Imperial miles per gallon. I'm saying Imperial because I'm aware that it's not just people in the UK who watch these videos and US miles per gallon is quite a bit different. I'll put it on screen whenever I mention the fuel economy so you can see the differences and you've got litres per 100 kilometres and kilometres per litre as well. So there's four different ways the world tends to measure car fuel economy. I've got the climate control set to 20 degrees Celsius with air conditioning on. Both cars do not have heated seats and both cars have three levels of automatic climate control, low, medium and high. And I'm keeping them all, or both of them, all, there's only two, both of them on low. I'm sort of regretting that a little bit though because I am feeling a little bit warm in here at the moment. It's a hot day, 25 degrees outside. It's at 20 degrees in here, but I still feel a bit warm and I'm starting to wish I'd turn that down a little bit or put it on medium, but I'm gonna keep it the same for the test in both cars. I'll suffer being mildly warm to try and keep things a bit more fair. Something I enjoy about this car is that when me and my other half go on a long road trip and we decide to take this one, she's more willing to drive it. She can drive a manual, but she doesn't like to, she avoids it. So if we go in this one, she's more willing to share some of the miles, but also there's actually like a fridge here. It's not actually a fridge, it's a cold box that uses the air conditioning. Even if you're heating the cabin, it still keeps that box cold. So you get a cold drink and some sandwiches in there for your long journey, which is very pleasant. Also, the air conditioning doesn't seem to affect fuel economy much. Apart from on a hot day, you'll notice a bit of a difference, but when it's not hot, just leave it on all the time, keeps that box cold, but doesn't seem to eat into fuel economy. And that's because the air conditioning compressor is only on demand. It only works as hard as it needs to. So keeping that box cold doesn't require much energy in the winter. And at the same time, it will still help prevent the windows from fogging up by drying out the air a bit. Something I really don't like about this car though is just how woolly the steering is and how wallowy it is. You don't really feel connected to the road. You feel like you're telling it where to go and then somebody else tells it where to go for you. It's a bit vague, like I want to steer over there, okay I'll go over there a bit for you, no, a bit more please. And Whereas in my Leon, it's a much more direct drive. It's more enjoyable to drive, especially on a country road. Around town, when I'm driving slowly like this, it doesn't really, doesn't really matter. But when I'm driving more quickly, that's when, that's when it becomes apparent. I've managed to include a 20 zone for you. So um, don't say I never give you anything. Unfortunately, this car doesn't have cruise control down to 20. It only goes down to 25, so I actually have to regulate the gas myself, which I don't really like doing in 20s because it feels very slow. Although this area, 20 does make sense. So it feels more natural doing 20 around here. It is town. It's only probably about two to three minutes of the total journey. I'm thinking this city route would take me in total about 45 minutes. It's 45 minutes worth of driving. That's a good test. 
to see how economical it is. And at the moment, I'm 11 miles in, 60 miles per gallon. Impressed by that. Doesn't usually get that because usually when I start a journey, it's a cold start. Usually a journey like this, it'll probably be about 55 miles per gallon because cars do use, or should I say engines, do use more fuel whilst they are heating up. Just coming to the end of the city drive, done over 16 miles. I'll put on screen what the fuel economy is when I stop. I'm not there yet, but I'll put it on screen now. And also I'll include what I think it is, actually I shouldn't signal here because there is actually an entrance on the left there. Very small, but I'll signal after that. Also I'll put on screen what my estimate of the economy is based off the trip computer because usually this overreads by about 7%. So I'll put that on screen as well. Let's see if I can find somewhere to park. Is this mini moving out? Because that'll be a good place for me. I'm not sure. Doesn't look like it, so I'm gonna carry on past them. Hoping there'll be a place here. Actually, I'll go on the right here quickly. So what does it say? You already know it's on screen, I don't know yet. 64.1 miles per gallon. Very impressive. Again, that wouldn't be that good if it was a cold start. I reckon that'll be in the high 50s. We typically get in the mid 50s, the high 50s in this car. Right, now for the dual carriageway and 70 miles per hour. So I'm in a 30 at the moment, but straight away within a minute of driving, I'm gonna be doing 70 miles an hour or as close to 70 as I can on the dual carriageway. I will try to stay at 70, but it does depend on the traffic. Here's the national speed limit sign. And this is where this car is surprising. It does just seem to, in gear at least, accelerate very quickly for the 0 to 60 time. Well, this car's a bit slow, so I'm gonna slow down going behind them. They're only doing about 46 miles an hour, 48. Slotted myself between two cars there. And I think I have an opportunity here, so I'm gonna pop it up to 70 miles an hour. Engage the cruise control. And there we go, and see how it does. Felt a little bit more sluggish there. I pressed the gas pedal a bit too hard and then it changed down the gears. It probably would have accelerated just as well if it stayed in the higher gear and used its torque. That's where I prefer manual because I get to decide whether or not that happens. The best fuel economy we've ever got from this car on the trip computer on a long journey was 65 miles per gallon. And that was driving from Fort William because we decided to go up Nevis and if you go up Ben Nevis you generally stay in or around Fort William and that was Fort William in Scotland back to Colchester England quite a long journey can't remember how far took the majority of the day but 65 miles per gallon at 70 miles an hour this car is actually doing 67 to 68 when I've tested it it flickers between the two which is fairly typical, I find, when a car says it's doing 70, you're actually doing 67. But I'll stick to the speedo speed. I don't want to confuse people or lead people to believe that I am speeding. This is where this car is at home. On these journeys, it's comfortable. The lack of steering feel or the wallowy suspension doesn't matter. It's just comfortable over the bumps and it's quiet when you're cruising. It's not a lot of road noise in here and wind noise is quite low too. I'm about two thirds of the way through the 70 mile per hour route now, just gonna get ready to leave. I'm gonna turn around at this junction and then come back again. So that's 14 miles and 61.3 miles per gallon so far. The reason why I don't use the fuel tank method to work out fuel economy on these tests is because it's not accurate when you're only using three liters of fuel. Because the click off on the pump varies by about half a liter and half a liter out of three is a lot. I'm better off using the trip computer. The fuel tank method works well when you're filling up the tank from empty because then that half a liter isn't such a big variation and it's probably more accurate 
than the trip computer in that instance. Now, some people say, just fill it up to the top so you can see the fuel at the top of the neck of the fuel filler, uh, the fuel filler neck. But that's not a good idea. In doing that, you can damage your EVAP system. So I don't recommend that. I finish filling up at the first or at a push at the second click. I don't try to brim my tank or the filler neck. Okay, I'm coming to the end of the dual carriageway, the 70 mile per hour road. And I've got a leave here. It's not a very long slip road, so I'm slowing down just before I leave. Very pleased with that run. I managed to stay close to 70 for most of it. There we go. Into the 30 zone. Oh, they've rebuilt their wall. That wall was knocked down last time I was here. I'm sure they have to rebuild that often as cars don't slow down as they leave the 70 mile per hour road. And I'm gonna stop on this road on the right, as I did in my last test where I compared a one litre engine with a two litre engine. If you're interested in that video, I'll leave a link on screen now. So I'll put it on screen what the fuel economy is for when I stop. I'm gonna stop just, I think on the right here is probably best not to block anyone. And it's 67.2. Wow, that's very good. Um, 24 miles. I've put on screen what that is uh, in different units and also what my calculation is based on the fact this trip computer tends to overread by about 7%. That's based on many um, full tanks where I filled it from empty to full many times. That's roughly where it is. As I say, it works all right if you're doing a full tank, but when you're only just filling up the top bit after using three litres over 45 minutes or something, it doesn't seem to work very well, that fill tank method. I'm not entirely sure what to expect from this car on these roads because I tend not to drive this car on these roads. It doesn't feel at home. The steering's just too woolly. I'm guessing it's going to do about 50 miles per gallon. I'm going to try and do 60 where it's safe to do 60, but I am going to be sticking within the speed limit. I'm not going to be braking hard or accelerating hard, just moderate acceleration, moderate braking and safe driving, safe and legal driving. And we'll see what the economy is. So it's a safe bit of road up this hill to be doing 60 miles per hour. So that's what I'm doing. Just over two miles in and 39.7 miles per gallon. That will go up though. I am going up a very long hill at the moment. And once I've gone up this hill, I think it's pretty much flat the rest of the way. Maybe it's even slightly downhill. I shouldn't complain too much. I mean, it is quite capable on these roads. It's just the feeling of disconnection is always present. So it's not enjoyable. Capable, yes, just not enjoyable. This car weighs, oh, I can't remember. I think it's 1,440 kilograms. I'll put it on screen. I might be wrong. And my car, the Leon, which I'll drive soon, weighs 1,211 kilos. So that's quite a bit lighter. Uh, they made a big deal about that being light when that car was released and you do feel it. Wheels though, are exactly the same, same tire sizes. They're both 225, 45, 17. I'm in a 30 zone at the moment. Of course, when you drive on country roads, it's not 60 the whole time. I've just been in a 40, now I'm in a 30 as I go through Tiptree, but a lot of it will have a 60 limit where I can accelerate and brake. At the moment, I'm four miles in, 46.3 miles per gallon. Getting near the end of the country roads now, just in the 40. I've been very pleased with this run. I've had barely no traffic, so I've been able to make the most out of the 60 limits where it's safe to do so. And at the moment, I've done 17 miles, not finished yet, but nearly, that's 17 miles and 56.4 miles per gallon. Okay, that's the end. 17 miles and 57.6, it's saying there. Uh, I'll put that on screen with all the different conversions. I will wait until I've parked though. If it changes, I'll go with the reading I get once I've parked. It's only just gone up to 57.6. So I wouldn't be surprised if it goes back down again in the time it takes me to park the car. Okay, going up to the wall. Done. So, 57.6. Now let's try out the Leon. 
It's so nice to have a cold drink on a hot day. I'm gonna miss that cold box. Why can't all cars have a cold box? It's just using the air conditioning. It's not really that difficult to implement. Anyway, city driving in the Leon, reset the trip computer, and away we go. As soon as I get into this car, I straight away feel like I have more control. It's hard to put into words, but I'll try and explain. The Citroen feels more elastic. So when you turn the wheel, it feels like there's a little bit more of delay and it's a bit more vague as to where you go. And the car sort of rolls about a little bit more. So with the bumps, it wallows around and there's more body roll. This has a slightly firmer ride, but it's not uncomfortable. But when I steer, the car steers. It feels like I have direct control of what's happening without delay. I'm leaving the stop start system switched on for this test. I usually have it switched off in this car because it doesn't work very well. It takes too long to start, it shakes the car when it starts, and it takes a while for it to produce power after it starts. So if I try and move away the moment the engine turns on, it's actually quite likely to stall because there's no power there. I have to wait like one second, which feels like a long time, but I will leave it on for this test because I left it on in the Citroen. So clutch down, engine starts, now move away and I'm confident it will get going without either struggling or stalling. In the Citroen it was reading 25 degrees, in the Leon it's reading 24.5 degrees, so the outside temperature sensors are about the same. But I'm leaving the climate control set to auto at 20 and on its lowest auto settings. What I mean by the lowest auto setting is that when it's on high auto, it's willing to blow air more quickly and fiercely, but when it's on low, it will try and keep it at 20 degrees, but it never quite blows as hard. There's three settings, low, medium, and high. I like to wait for that bus there because they do need both sides of the road when they come round there, and some buses wait for you. <laughs> and others don't, so I just tend to wait just in case it's one that doesn't. Again, I'm driving rather sedately within the speed limit, gentle braking, gentle accelerating, but I'm not trying to be specially economical. I'm just doing my normal rate of acceleration and braking and staying safe and legal. Okay, I've gone the wrong way again on purpose because I did that last time. I was meant to go right at the roundabout and go through the 20 zone, but I've gone down this road instead, just because that's what I habitually do when I drive this way. I avoid the 20 and go down the 40. So I'll do the same thing again as I did last time. I will be taking the advice of the gear shift indicator. It's recommending fifth gear at this speed, so I will take its advice and do what the computer says, as I was in the Citroen by leaving it in auto. I'm not gonna do it when I'm accelerating and braking, no, but I'll do it when I'm at a constant speed because the computer can't see what I'm accelerating or braking for. So its advice isn't very relevant. But when I'm cruising at a constant speed, then it knows what gear is the most economical. And then neutral, clutch up, and let that horrible stop-start system do its job. So there's a bit of a queue this time because of the temporary traffic lights. I've been here since 14.04, so four minutes past two, and we'll see how long it takes, but that is a bit of a disadvantage for this car. Ooh, am I gonna make it on the first green? So it's two minutes in. Ah, damn it, never mind. So it's probably gonna be another two minutes now. And green. So that was four minutes of traffic, although most of that time the engine was switched off. So it shouldn't hurt the test too much. What's interesting about the trip computer on this car is when it was new, it used to overread by six, seven percent, like most cars do. And as it got closer to a hundred thousand miles, it actually got more accurate. And when it was around a hundred thousand miles, it was very accurate. Often I would get exactly what the computer claimed. But 
as miles have piled on, and it's on 200,000 now, just over 200,000, it's become more pessimistic. And at the moment, it actually underreads by 6%. So if it says I've got 46 miles per gallon on the trip computer, turns out often I've actually got 49 or even 50 miles per gallon. This car has a 50 litre fuel tank and the Citroen has a 60 litre fuel tank. I don't wait until it's empty before I fill up. Usually I fill up at around about three bars out of eight and I typically get between 350 and 400 miles. Whereas Gosha, my other half in her car, she often gets more than 600 miles out of a tank, but she does wait until it is quite low before she fills up. And we've had in the 800s out of a tank. In fact, on one long journey, I remember when we filled up the trip computer predicting over 900 miles of range. We didn't end up doing that in the end because we didn't keep that economy for the whole trip. But either way, very long legs, a big range on that car. Nearly finished the city driving now. I'll put on screen what it says at the end. At the moment it's saying 42.6, but I'll put on screen right now what it actually says when I park up. So you've got some time to look and digest it. And also I'll include on screen what I think it would get if I was to fill it up from empty because I know this car does underread a little bit. It's a bit pessimistic. So see where I can park. I've got the same space as last time. So I think I'll go for that. Oh no, the Mercedes has got it, but there's another one behind it. So I'll use that. And parked 42.6 miles per gallon average speed of 19 miles an hour this trip computer gives me more information 51 minutes it was four minutes longer than the last one roughly because there was those temporary roadworks and 16 miles of course the same as last time i don't know how that compares to the citroen because i can't remember but you'll know because it's on screen and i'll find out later when i look at my records now it's time for the 70 mile an hour roads. So the trip computer's been reset when I was stopped. 70 miles an hour coming up now. I'm in fourth gear. Yeah, and just like the Citroen, there's plenty of low down shove. There's no need for me to go down a gear. If I give it some gas, it will get going. I'm able to go a little bit faster this time because the traffic is moving a bit quicker. and looks like I can go to lane two, so I'll do that. And hopefully I can get up to 70 miles an hour and stay at that speed as long as I did last time. I did very well last time. It seems a little bit more busy now, but still not bad. There you go, 67 miles an hour, setting the cruise control to 70. And this car, like most cars, does underread. Uh, when it says I'm doing 70, actually, usually I'm doing closer to 66. So it underreads a little bit more than the Citroen. So in fairness to this car, it has a little bit of an advantage because when I'm doing 70, I'm actually going a little bit slower. But I'm not going to go more than 70 on the speedo because I know people will make issue of that. Not everyone, but some people will. I'm about two thirds of the way through the 70 mile an hour route now. I'm just leaving to turn around at the roundabout and go back again. Um, average speed, 61 miles an hour, 46 miles per gallon. I've done 15 miles and it's taken me 14 minutes. This car on these roads, how it differs from the Citroen. It's very similar actually, because you're not doing a lot. You're just sitting there cruising along. I would say, this car probably has a little bit less wind noise, but I'm not sure, it might just be a bit less windy. It is almost the same sound in here as far as my ears are concerned. But when I put my foot on the gas pedal, it makes a different sound. The diesel makes more of a grumble, it's a bit more gruff, whereas this one just tends to hiss a bit. You hear the hiss of the turbo and then it gets going. If you would like me to review this car, hopefully I will do soon. I've been waiting until it gets to 200,000 miles. It's there now. I just need to find some time to do it and it probably will be on my other channel because that is more of a car review channel than this one. But I've owned it nine and a half years, 200,000 miles, not all of them are me because I sit in the 
driver's seat and the passenger seat. I'm a driving instructor, but I've been in the car throughout most of those miles. Even on test, I normally sit in on the car. Most of my pupils want me to sit in and observe during their test. It helps them because if they fail, I know exactly what's happened, but it also helps me because I get a very good idea of exactly how the examiners mark the test. But when I get the opportunity, I will review this car. Things have gone wrong over its life, but I would say, or should I say I will say, it's got more reliable as it's got older. When I originally ordered it, it was a very new model, hadn't been out for long, most of the components were new, and therefore there were some teething issues. And they seem to have sorted them because the things that they did fix, well, those problems never came back again. Okay, that's the end of the 70 mile an hour road. Exactly the same as last time. Really pleased with that. I got to do 70 most of the time and 23 miles, 25 minutes, average speed of 57 miles per hour, 48.2 miles per gallon. This car always impresses me at those speeds, considering it is a petrol, it does do very well. And that does under read. So that's probably gonna be closer to about 52, but I'll put that also on screen, what I think it actually is based on my experience of filling this car up with fuel, like I think it's nearly 700 times now. All right, onto the country roads. Now I'm probably about halfway through this country drive now. Unfortunately, I'm stuck behind a car going a bit slow for the conditions, not drastically slow, but slower than I would be. But up until here, I have actually been able to make use of the 60 roads. And I will say I'm enjoying this car more. I feel more connected to the road. Although in-gear performance is similar, it's smoother. The way the engine pulls, it feels smoother. And if I wanna go fast, which I'm not because I'm testing the cars and it will be silly to drive one quicker than the other. I'm trying to drive them at a similar speed. But if I want to go fast, I can leave it in a lower gear for longer and it's got some revs and it will go a lot faster. The car in front's doing about 50. Here I would be probably doing a bit more than that, probably 55, maybe even 60 on some of the parts, not here because, because of the bend coming up. So it's a little bit slower but close enough. I don't think I'll get two journeys without any traffic at all. When I was driving the Citroen, I was pretty much on my own all the way down here, which was really quite nice. Oh, and I should probably give you an update on the fuel economy. So I'm 10 miles into this country drive, 22 minutes, average speed, 27 miles an hour, and I've averaged 42.3 miles per gallon so far just coming into the 30 great wigbra into fourth gear as that's the gear this car recommends at 30 although if i put it into fifth i do find i get slightly better fuel economy but it doesn't ask for fifth it doesn't complain if i go into fifth at 30 it doesn't say no go back down to fourth but it doesn't ask for it and i'm going to do what the computer asks for during this drive I finished the second from last stretch of 60 and I'm at 42.3 miles per gallon. Most of this country drive I've had in this car has been without traffic. There's only a short stretch where I was stuck behind a car, only going a little bit slower than I would have done anyway. Hopefully I have the last stretch of 60 to myself, but I won't know that until I get there. So the last stretch of national speed limit, 60 miles per hour, but unfortunately there's a skip lorry up ahead and a little bit of traffic has, um, well actually the skip lorry's pulling away, but there is a bit of traffic behind it and I'm not able to go quite as fast as I want to. So bear in mind when I uh, look at the economy figure after this run, that this was a slightly slower drive than it was in the Citroen, although that was only for the last bit. I mean, put it in context, I've done 16 miles and I've probably got about two miles left. That's the end of the trip. I'll put on screen what the final economy figures are and the comparison. I won't know again until I park up because I'm going to use the economy I get from parking. Let's park next to the Citroen. and I can't see the fuel economy because the reverse sensors are taking up the screen. Okay, what's it say? 43.6 miles per gallon. 
18 miles, 40 minutes, and an average speed of 27 miles per hour. Bear in mind though, that was a little bit slower than I was in the Citroen. But for the other routes, I think they were very similar. Apart from the city route in this car, I did have four minutes of traffic lights, uh, but I was stopped with the engine off most of that time. So there we are, figures are on screen. You can see for yourself. And I think it's no surprise for many that the diesel was by far more economical. Most of us know that. But the question is, is it worth it? Well, it wasn't for me, I have a petrol, and this is not my first driving instructor car, but it is my first petrol driving instructor car, and I've covered 200,000 miles in it. I had diesels from between 2008 and 2014. So why did I choose the petrol? Well, it wasn't because of cost. The diesel, doing 30,000 miles a year, still worked out cheaper. Even when I considered the extra cost of fuel the extra cost to buy the car, dual mass flywheels. This has a single mass flywheel. If you don't know what that is, it's a component in the car that learners are quite likely to damage um, and, ex and it's expensive to replace. But if you have a single mass flywheel, the simple one, it's very hard to damage those and they're cheaper to replace. So this has a single one, which cheaper, less likely to be damaged, less complication. Hmm, that's good. And I also considered DPFs as well and the trouble I had with having a car with a DPF in worrying about having too many beginners in a row because DPFs require the car usually to be driven more at speed, more longer journeys, not sitting in a nursery area teaching someone how to drive, teaching them clutch control, it can bother them. So I was worried about booking too many beginners in, in a row. So not having that hassle was also a reason why I chose petrol, that was a big one. But also, I just prefer petrol. I prefer how they rev, I prefer how they drive. Smoother, quieter, and it stalls more politely. So when my pupil does stall the car, it doesn't sort of go <laughs> and make them scared. It kind of just goes, <laughs> and like, oh, what was that? And then I explain. So overall for me, I prefer petrol. For you, that may be different. Depends on your circumstances. And if you tow, if you tow weight, generally speaking, diesel is better. So when it comes to how much it costs, well, whether or not diesel or petrol is better for you, that comes down to you. But what about what comes out the back of the car, the emissions? Well, this is the complicated bit, and maybe you could even call it the controversial bit. Because when I had diesels between 2008 and 2014, diesels were being pushed on people. The government in England, now I'm saying England because the UK is England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but often we all have slightly different rules and I don't know if their rules are the same as England's rules. I just know England, so I'm gonna say England. The government in England were focusing on CO2 emissions, tailpipe emissions, and they were offering lower tax, car tax and company car tax to cars that emitted a certain level or below a certain level of CO2. And it just so happened that they designed this, so diesels, some diesels, the most economical diesels, just about slipped into that. It's got to be by design, hasn't it? They just about slipped into that lower bracket where you could get cheap tax. So therefore, people started buying diesels. Diesel cars actually produce more CO2 per litre, but they burn fewer litres, meaning overall they produce less CO2. People started buying diesels big time. They were rare before, buses, commercial vehicles, not many cars, but before you knew it, new car sales were around about 50-50 petrol and diesel. But then, it turned out that diesels weren't as clean as expected. Yes, they produce less CO2, but they emit many other harmful gases which are bad for humans, particularly if you have loads of diesel cars in a built up area. We enter ULEZ and low emission zones to try and get rid of the diesel from those areas. And this is the irony, just as that happened, diesels actually became comparable to petrol in terms of how clean they are. So 
People are now put off by diesel because they're being stung by this daily charge to drive in the city, which means they're less likely to buy a diesel as they're afraid that maybe their city will be subject to a charge soon or more cities and they'll have this car that's worth nothing. That was the thing in the news. Oh, my diesel's not gonna be worth anything in the future because you have to pay a daily charge. Right, next car I'm buying is petrol. I'm not taking that risk. And therefore people stop buying diesel. Manufacturers stop investing in the technology because people aren't buying them. So there's less investment and therefore it develops less. It's kind of stuck where it is. Which is, I call it ironic because when diesels are actually harmful and emitting or harmful pollution, people were buying them. And now they're actually comparable to petrol, people aren't buying them. Can you see how it's a mess? Who knows what's going to happen in the future though, because now the government, and I think this is the UK government, not just England, are banning petrol and diesel cars from 2030 because they're very much focused in on tailpipe emissions. And they're not thinking about the overall production of emissions for the full life cycle of the vehicle. And obviously, depending on where you charge it in the country makes a difference to the CO2 that's going to be generated. So in the future, who knows? Maybe they will introduce more rules or more tax based on how polluting it is to create that car. But we're not there yet. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But I do know that, and we, we know, it's fact. It's there, it happened. We've had, to, we've had to implement low emission zones in cities because diesel cars weren't as clean as we thought they were. I'm not an engineer and I'm not a scientist. I'm a driving instructor. So if you think I don't know what I'm talking about, then well, you may well be right because this isn't my topic, is it? I teach people to drive, but I do know this. If when I'm teaching someone to drive, I'm restricting myself to the tools in this box that I was given when I was training to be an instructor, I can often struggle to help my pupil, particularly if they're a challenging pupil to teach. However, if I remove that box and those restrictions and I go, okay, right, I need to be safe and I need to be legal. And of course I need to be respectful towards the pupil. Well, I can surprise myself with what ideas I can come up with to help the pupil. And I think the same thing may be the case for the engineer. In banning petrol and diesel engines from 2030, that may be like restricting the engineer for what tools they can use to reach and achieve what we want to achieve. It can be like handcuffing them a little bit. Instead of banning that technology, why not set a standard? Say, oh, also regulate the whole life cycle of the vehicle as well, not just the tailpipe emissions, because if you're genuinely interested in keeping the planet a nice place to live, you don't ignore one bad thing and focus on just the other, or even one bad thing out of many. You focus on the whole thing. So instead of banning petrol and diesel engines, why not focus on setting a standard that looks at the whole vehicle and say, okay, for production, we need to be down here for that gas, down here for that mineral. We wanna try and achieve this mining practice. Oh, and for emissions, you've gotta be below here. And you can base it on what the current electric vehicle is capable of because they do produce CO2. Creating electricity in most countries produces some CO2, some more than others, and then regulate that standard so that engineers can't cheat their way around it. So regulate it well, unlike the Euro 5 emission standard where engineers did manage, not all of them, but some of them did manage to cheat their way around it. So regulate it well, set the standard, and give the engineer freedom to come up with a solution. It may well be that the only solution they can come up with is, you know what, we've really thought about this, tried loads of things, and I think, 
electric vehicles are the only way we can achieve this standard. Or they may come up with something that we don't expect, something that could potentially be even cleaner. We don't know unless we give them the freedom to try. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Well, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're looking for car insurance, check out links to Collingwood and Confused in the description. If you're learning to drive and want to insure yourself on somebody else's car, then Collingwood are there for you because you can do so without affecting the owner's policy. And that can take away a big stress from the owner of that car that you're using for your practice, to practice learning to drive. Via the link at the moment, there's up to 35% off and a £20 Amazon gift card. If you want to insure your own car, I recommend checking out the link to confuse.com because you fill out one quote form and get loads of quotes back from many insurers to compare who's cheapest. And you can change your car on that quote without having to do the whole quote again as many times as you like to compare how much it costs to insure different cars. That's useful if you're shopping around for cars. Using the links doesn't cost you anything, but it does support the channel. So thank you very much. Subscribe to get my future videos. And until the next one, cheerio.